For our first example, we are going to uh, look at uh, quantifying a spectrum. So um, I'm going to choose a, uh, a spectrum that is a, uh, a glass. So it's uh, one of the engineered glasses that uh, we have available to us here at NIST. It's called uh, K309. Um, it looks like this. Um, I can um, uh, put some uh, uh, line markers on it. I'm going to use the uh, expedited mechanism, which involves uh, using the uh, material database. It knows uh, the material database has a uh, entry for K309, so I can just type that into the KLM line dialog box. Hit Control Enter, and it puts all the lines up here. As you can see, this element has a, or this material has a number of different elements in it. It has uh, uh, calcium, oxygen, uh, barium, iron, aluminum, silicon, and uh, maybe even um, a little bit of titanium. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, we'll find out. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, um, go over to the uh, Tools menu and select the Quantification Alien. Um, the Quantification Alien basically is a uh, 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 will step you through the process of quantifying a spectrum. So um, we're going to determine the composition of an unknown spectrum by MLSQ fitting to standards. I'll select Next. It's going to ask me about the information that is contained in the spectrum. So this was, in fact, collected on this, this particular instrument with this particular detector and at this particular beam energy. Usually this information should be correct so long as the default detector, which is set up over here, is, is correct. So um, I'm going to uh, quantify using uh, this using uh, some uh, spectra directly as, as uh, uh, standards. Um, in another video, I'll show you probably a better way to do this. But for the moment, uh, so I'm going to go and select a series of spectra. I'm going to select Al203, barium fluoride, calcium fluoride, iron, silicon, titanium, and zinc. Um, you can see previews down in this region over here. And uh, because uh, uh, some of these spectra have multiple elements in it and it is ambiguous which element we wish to use, we have to specify which element. So I'm going to select calcium from calcium fluoride. I'm going to select barium from barium fluoride. I'm going to select both aluminum and oxygen from uh, alumina. And then the other elements, zinc, titanium, iron, and silicon, are all uh, unambiguous. Uh, you'll notice that when I loaded the spectra that they knew automatically what the composition of the spectrum was. This isn't magic. It just happens to be that that information is inside these spectra. And in another video, I'll show you how that's done. So. Having selected the uh, spectra, you can see that the uh, probe current is specified in each one of them. The live time is also available. And uh, you can see it also calculates what the Duane Hunt limit is. And since uh, this, this should be nominally about 15 uh, kilovolts, and these are roughly there, you can see that some of the ones, like this uh, Illumina, which is a um, insulator, the Duane Hunt uh, uh, measured off of it is a little on the low side, and this isn't to be too surprising on uh, on uh, insulators. So um, I've specified an element for every um, uh, spe specified a standard for every element in this uh, in this material. So I don't have to specify an extra element. There are options if I wanted to do things like oxygen by stoichiometry or element by difference, but we're not going to do that right now. Okay, so we get one last, uh, we get an opportunity here. Uh, in this particular case, I took a, a, a simple standards that, uh, for which um, a reference isn't required. This is something that's a little bit complicated, and we'll get into this in another uh, uh, video. But for the moment, um, everything here looks good. 
There are a couple of these that uh, report back as the signal to noise is poor. So these are um, the uh, lines that will be fit. So the titanium L line will be fit, but also the titanium K line. And it's important that at least one line per element is considered good. Um, and you can see that for every element that's in fact the case. Next, uh, we get to specify which lines to use to quantify. Uh, the program is smart enough to pick these lines on its own, and so you really don't need to specify it. So, uh, in certain cases, it's unambiguous. For oxygen, aluminum, silicon, and calcium, there really is only one good choice. However, for titanium, iron, zinc, and barium, there are options with K's and L lines, or L's and M lines. Um, we could just leave it as auto, and that's probably what you want to do most of the time, in which case um, the program will make a good choice uh, based on uh, count statistics and uh, uncertainties. Um, you could also specify it by uh, picking a specific line, so titanium K line is almost uh, definitely the best line to use. Um, or you can just hit the default button and it'll pick the most probable line from uh, that. This is non-adaptive, so it doesn't actually look at the, the uh, spectrum data. It just uses rules of thumbs if you hit default, but it's, off, it's usually the best answer. And then we select Next again, and we get one last opportunity to specify our unknown, make sure that the lifetime probe current are all set up, and uh, it's... Uh, uh, looks good. So next we're going to um, actually perform the quantification and we get our first indications of what the results look like. So we can see from this that the uh, first measure that we can use to determine how the quant went looks pretty good. We have an analytical total uh, or a sum of, uh, of uh, very close to 100 percent or, or unity. Uh, that's our first suggestion that probably uh, everything went reasonably well on this, uh, this quantification. So I can then go click the finish button and um, now in addition to that original spectrum now you have a couple uh, additional ones added in. You have the original one, you have the residual spectrum, and then you have a simulated spectrum. So we're first going to compare the, uh, the 309 with the residual, so the original with the residual. The residual is essentially a, a, a way of visualizing how well the fit went. Ideally, the, the, the residual will look like this. In this region, you see that although it's maybe noisy underneath the K line, uh, the K uh, for calcium, uh, on average, it looks very smooth underneath these lines. And that suggests that we're, the, the fit uh, went well, that we selected the correct elements, and that uh, we didn't miss any elements. If you look over here in silicon, we see that there's a little S curve underneath here. Uh, this uh, probably is a result of some sort of chemical shift between the uh, the the environment that the uh, standard pure silicon and the glass um, but generally looks good. As we get down to lower energies the fit looks slightly less good and that's usually anticipated because um, uh, it gets more complicated, there's more uh, chemistry going on, more solid state effects so we need to worry about those. But in general the residual look good and that's our second clue that we've uh, uh, done a, uh, a, a good job. So I can take a look at the report now. And the report basically tells us what we did. So we quantified a uh, 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 spectrum uh, by fitting it to an un uh, standards to an unknown. Uh, we used these algorithms, this detector, um, under these conditions. We used um, these materials as uh, uh, as standard, so for oxygen we used alumina, aluminum we used this, 
So we have a complete record of all the conditions that we, uh, we used for this quantification. So if we ever wanted to go back and uh, redo it, including actually a link to the original uh, spectrum that if you were to click on it, it actually loads it into the, uh, into the user interface. So uh, we have all of this information. So these are the standards. We didn't require any references, so that uh, section's empty. The results are displayed down here. It says what the spectrum was, and then uh, uh, an enormous amount of information, maybe an overwhelming amount of information. In the end, uh, you should probably end up focusing on the, uh, the grade um, uh, boxes. Uh, in that case, in this case, it's the mass fraction because um, uh, this is probably what we want to go ahead and report. So, for this element, oxygen, we can see that we measured uh, point. 393, three. so 39.3% by mass, oxygen, 7.6% by mass, aluminum, 18.3% uh, by mass, uh, silicon, and so forth through all of the elements. In this case, the table is a little wider because we have a lot of elements in here. Uh, if we wanted to look at the normalized mass fraction, we have that available. We also have it reported as atom fraction, too. And we also have error bars placed on here. So the total error bar for oxygen is, is about uh, is plus or minus 5%. Uh, so 39% plus or minus 5%. And the attribution of those uncertainties is listed over here. So it turns out that the largest uncertainty is due to the, uh, the mass absorption coefficient, which because oxygen is a fairly uh, low energy x-ray, uh, is uh, fairly uh, uh, poorly known. On other of the elements, we get far better uncertainties because they're a bit harder x-rays and we're uh, more uh, likely to be measuring them very accurately. Uh, we also get a link to the residual. So um, this uh, report uh, gives you all the information you need to uh, be able to uh, reproduce this particular analysis. So one last trick is if you uh, wish to uh, export this information, you can often use the tabulate function over here. And uh, we'll get more into uh, uh, what the various different uh, options you have on the command line are. But uh, tabulate is probably the one I use the most because it allows me to summarize the, the results of, uh, of multiple measurements in a table that looks like that, that then I can uh, highlight and copy and then paste into a uh, spreadsheet. And there are various options to allow you to uh, uh, tabulate in various different formats. The default is mass fraction, but you can also tabulate atom fraction, and you can also uh, uh, put the error, the uncertainties on the measurement. So there's a lot of options here, and uh, we've just very uh, gone over them very briefly. But I hope it gives you an idea of what we can do using the quantification tool.